awesome. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for your patience as we got set up here. Welcome to this holiday and MS trivia conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm joined by Dr. Ben Thrower, who is the Senior Medical Director of the Andrew C. Carlos Institute, MS Institute at Shepherd Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And he is contributor to MS Focus Magazine and our Senior Medical Advisor here. I love doing the holiday trivias. I think I've co-hosted with you three years in a row now. <laughs> Maybe yeah. I should let somebody else do it next time, but I can't help it. This is one of my favorite ones, and I look forward to it every year. It's so much fun, you guys. So if this is your first time, we welcome you, and I'm going to have a blast. So, Dr. Thor, I'll turn it over to you for opening comments. Very good. Thank you uh, to everyone who's who's joined in, and thank you to all of the wonderful uh, staff at the at the MS Focus. We really appreciate everything you do, and I'm, you've had a, a wonderful past year. And thank you for your service to the to the MS community. So I, I echo that sentiment. This is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I'm a, a bit of a uh, of a, a holiday geek uh, in terms of like Christmas movies and just just weird holiday trivia. Um, I try to tone it down a little bit. My wife says, you know, not everyone has the has the love for uh, minutia and detail that you do. So we're going to learn some about MS this afternoon. I'm going to throw out some. Uh, MS questions. Uh, I'm always just blown away at how knowledgeable the MS community is uh, with with their knowledge uh, of MS. And then we'll th mix in some some holiday trivia. Uh, we're used to doing these pre-COVID live, so people simply raise their hands or shout it out. Or so what we'll do um, is maybe try to. We'll see the first person that hits the raise their hand button. Um, uh, and I guess, do you want to have them come on live on the air and give their answer? Yeah, so it, you can choose whichever you'd like, guys. I know when we have done this in the past over Zoom, some people have typed their um, questions or the answers to the questions into the chat, or some have used Q&A, some have raised hand. It's really on what we see from our end first. So um, I think typing into the chat would be quicker, but our eyes are pretty much everywhere, so it doesn't matter which one yeah. you choose. <laughs> awesome. And as Casey said earlier, we'll we'll do a, a random drawing at the end for a, a $100 uh, dollar gift card to hopefully brighten someone's holidays. So let's, let's kick it off. We're going to start off with a, a holiday trivia question. So this is a an artist rendering of the the real Saint Nicholas, the real person. So what country was the real uh, Saint Nicholas from? Got an answer already. <laughs> All right, who we got? Karen. She says Norway. Cor Karen gives us Norway. The, a lot of people like to go with the, the Northern European country. That that one's not correct, but that I, I can see why you'd want to go there. We always associate Santa with with uh, kind of the cold places like Norway. Germany, Jim says. Germany, not, again, great, it makes perfect sense. But yeah, the, this is an odd one. It's, uh, so, so think not Northern Europe. Okay. Armenia, Italy. Well, get, get getting closer, far. closer. <laughs> is it Italy? Get it. So he he had some connection. His he his remains, I think, may have briefly been interned in Italy, but but not not Italy. Okay, keep throwing them out, guys. <laughs> okay, I'll give you everyone a clue. Uh, favorite That's favorite good. meal at, at Thanksgiving. Turkey. Turkey, absolutely. So so Saint Nicholas was a real person. He was a a priest who uh, really liked ministering to the poor uh, in Turkey. Um, legend has it that uh, there was a family that was in uh, financial distress. Uh, they were in danger of actually losing their daughters due to the inability to afford them. And St. Nicholas walked by an open window and threw money into an empty shoe. And that's how a lot of our, our traditions of, you know, uh, St. Nicholas, Santa Claus delivering gifts. And uh, But he was a real person. This is actually a photograph of where he is. Uh, buried in in uh, Turkey. So, so you see what I mean with my my uh, nerdy love of of knowledge. So, shifting to multiple sclerosis, 
Uh, so monoc uh, so uh, MAB uh, in natalizumab, um, ocrelizumab, ublituximab, and ofatumumab stands for A, monolithic audio bomb, B, monocytic antigen broth, C, monoclonal antibody, or D, mammalian autoimmune basophil. The first person to answer was Karen again. She says C, monoclonal antibody. She is absolutely correct. So you know, monoclonal antibodies are a class of, of uh, therapies that are used across a, just a broad spectrum of health conditions. Uh, you know, autoimmune conditions like multiple sclerosis, just any number of things. So these are categorized as biologic agents. They are produced in a living cell. The idea is to, to, if you know a target in a health problem like multiple sclerosis, if you say, I think these two cells interacting, interacting with each other is important in this disease process. And if I know the receptors on those cells, I can now develop an antibody that blocks one of those receptors or maybe downregulates one of those cells. So these are all examples of, of those monoclonal uh, antibodies. And this, this technology has just exploded. I took our, our um, Shiloh Shepherd, a uh, big uh, German Shepherd lookalike dog to the vet. She had the allergies and they actually put her on a monoclonal antibody that within 48 hours shut her, her itchy skin and ears down just completely. Next question, which of these drugs is FDA approved to help improve walking speed? Would that be baclofen, Axar gel, Tysabri, or dalfampridine? Russell says D. You guys are just too smart. They're on it. So dalfampridine. So dalfampridine, um, uh, the name brand when it first came out was Ampira. It has gone generic. Another form of this that is compounded in mom and pop pharmacies is 4-aminopyridine or 4-AP. All of these molecules work on potassium channels on demyelinated nerve fibers. So that demyelinated nerve fiber in the brain or spinal cord will always be the weak link in the electrical conduction chain. So as you use that naked nerve fiber again and again and again, like with exertion, like with walking, or if you raise your core body temperature, sometimes that, that nerve fiber just shuts down electrically. It's called conduction block. You're not hurting it. You're not damaging it. You've just drained the battery. And if you rest, cool off, take a break for a while, that battery is going to recharge. When dalfampridine works, and it seems to work in about 40% of people with, with MS, um, it should help you be able to walk further, walk for a longer distance before your legs start giving out. Good job. So which of these drugs is not like the other? Kind of a little Sesame Street throwback. Uh, so here's your list. Ocrevus, ocrelizumab, tisabri, natalizumab, rituxan, rituximab, casimpta, ofatumumab, or truxima, which is a, a biosimilar of rituximab. Which of those is different from the others? Tiffany says D. She says D, ofatumumab. So you could make an argument so that's not the answer i'm looking for i could see why she might go there because that is the one subcutaneous medicine all the others are iv but i'm thinking more in terms of how the drugs work d in q a says e uh was that e e e so so rituximab is not what we're looking for so that one actually fits in with the the others and uh, Sherry says, or I'm sorry, Russell says A. A. Okay, we've, we've almost hit them all now. So A is not the one we're looking for either. It's good, good guesses, though, guys. D. Sherry says D. D I think we got we hit D already, I think. Uh, B. B, that's B, absolutely. That's the one we're looking for. So natalizumab is the only one on this list that is not a B cell therapy. So all of these other drugs, Ocrevus, Rituxan, Casimpta, Truxima, again, Truxima is just a biosimilar version of Rituxan. These are all anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies. So they all work on the B cells in the immune system. Isabri or natalizumab is a monoclonal antibody, but it works very differently. So when inflammatory cells cross the blood-brain barrier, 
and get into the brain and spinal cord and cause inflammation in a person with multiple sclerosis, that is not a passive process. Those cells actually have a receptor, those inflammatory cells have a receptor on their surface. Your blood brain barrier has a receptor. Think of it like a door. That inflammatory cell has to use its key in the lock and the door, the door opens, inflammatory cell goes in, Tysabri binds to the key on the inflammatory cell and doesn't let it cross the blood brain barrier. So good job. All right, back to holiday uh, uh, questions. So what is the name of the Christian holiday that celebrates the visit of the Magi or the three wise men? I see a lot of A's. What? Okay, so we've got Boxing Day, All Saints Day, Epiphany, Good Friday, Black Friday. The, the crowd is wanting to go with Boxing Day. That is, that's not what the answer we're looking for. So that's a Canadian holiday. And I'll, I'll confess, and I hope there are no Canadians here. They're going to send me angry letters. I, I don't actually know what Boxing Day celebrates, but I know it's a Canadian thing. And that's not the one we're looking for. I think it has to do with wrapping presents. Wrapping actually. presents. Um, Sherry says C, Epiphany. That is absolutely correct. Uh, or as we say here in Georgia, Epiphany. Um, so Epiphany is January 6th. It celebrates the uh, the arrival of the three wise men or the, the Magi um, uh, uh, at the, the, uh, the nativity. Um, in some uh, places, uh, Epiphany is actually a bigger deal than, than December 25th. So they actually celebrate more of, of the, the holiday on December, on January 6th. We have a tradition in our family that no Christmas decorations can come down until uh, after January 6th because you've got to keep the keep the holiday going. It's actually the last day of the 12 days of Christmas uh, also. All right, good job. So back to MS, what is the term for progression of symptoms uh, in a person with MS when there are no relapses and no new lesions on MRI. So which of these acronyms describes that? Is it PYRA, progression independent from relapse activity? Is it WTJS, well, this just sucks. Is it NIDA, no evidence of disease activity? Or is it EDSS, expanded disability status scale? Karen's coming in hot, I think. She says A. She is darn right, good job. So this is a big concept in the MS world right now. And I guarantee you someone you know, on this program is experiencing this. It's frustrating. It's a little mysterious to us. You know, what that sounds like in the exam room is the person with MS saying, you know, I feel like my walking has gotten a little bit worse, but you're telling me my MRI is stable and I've not had any relapses. What's going on? I think the important thing to know with you know with this situation we believe you we know this happens um and so it's, it actually has now an acronym attached to that and and it is being studied there are a lot of things we think that might contribute to this one is loss of neural reserve or the brain's ability to adapt to prior injuries and, and we do lose neural reserve with with aging the other concept that's being studied quite a bit is, is uh, smoldering inflammation or smoldering MS. The idea that if MS is a forest fire, maybe we're putting the big fire out with our disease modifying therapies, but maybe there's, there's just a little bit of you know, these embers underneath the surface, maybe you know small enough that we're not seeing on MRI, but significant enough to drive some, some uh, progression of symptoms. Good job. So which is of these is a type of primary MS fatigue? Is it anhedonia, lassitude, altitude, or borborygmy? I think Tiffany was first uh, this time. She said B, lassitude. You guys are just too smart. Uh, that is correct. So, so the two types of primary MS fatigue that we see are lassitude and nerve fiber fatigue. Lassitude is the non-exertional, non-heat-related um, fatigue. Uh, just comes on uh, and, and just zaps your ability to do anything. Whereas nerve fiber fatigue is the more exertion, heat-related uh, fatigue. And so for extra credit, who can tell me what borborygmy is? Anyone? 
If no, you guys no. want to raise your hand for that one, that's fine. So this is your new word for the day. You can impress your relatives at the holiday dinner table. Karen, please unmute. I, I think I'm probably wrong, but is that what they do in an exam where they rub the bottom of your foot? No, that's that's a good answer, though. I like that. So that's a Babinski. It's very close. Yeah, I like that answer. <laughs> uh, that's good. Good guess. Thanks. So borborygmy is the fancy medical term for, for your stomach rumbling if you're hungry. So so you <laughs> next time you're hungry, you can tell uh, someone that you're you're experiencing borborygmy and impress your, your friends and relatives. All right. Christmas. What was the dog's name and how the Grinch stole Christmas? Brittany says Max. That is absolutely correct. Good, good job. And for a little extra credit, so this this young lady here, Cindy Lou Who. So in the poem, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, how old is Cindy Lou Who? Oh, I was about to answer. Then I remembered I'm not playing. <laughs> <laughs> so tempting. <laughs> I see uh, Russell says six, Nora says six. You you would think she kind of looks like she'd be about six. And in the movie, she clearly was older than she was in the poem. So think of a poem, you know, rhyming, Cindy Lou Who, who was not more than two. Uh, two. two. Yeah, she, I don't, yeah, she's, she's a, a pretty bright looking two-year-old there. <laughs> Good job, guys. All right. Back to MS. So MS is the result of A, a weakened immune system, B, a dysregulated immune system, C, blockages in the small blood vessels to the brain, or D, early childhood injuries. Karen, you're so quick. Uh, she says B. <laughs> she, we have an immunologist ringer here, I think. That is correct. So a lot of people with MS mistakenly think that they have an underactive or a weakened immune system. And that's not correct. It, it would be better to say that it is a relatively overactive immune system. It's probably even more correct to say it's, it's a dysregulated immune system. So normally the immune system is all about checks and balances, inflammation and, and a sort of a toning down of that inflammation. With multiple sclerosis, you have an inappropriate, unregulated attack on the myelin and the nerve fibers, the axons in the brain and, and spinal cord. So yeah, that is absolutely correct. Good job. So myelin is mainly made up of A, protein, B, carbohydrates, C, fine Corinthian leather, or D, fat. Sherry says D. So we've got B, was that B? D as in David. D is in David. That is absolutely correct. You guys are just too good. So is it's so 95% of myelin is fat. Um, if you look at a fresh brain sample, a pathology sample, um, my, it, white matter myelin is very shiny. It, it's it's almost kind of gelatinous looking. It, it's and it's because it's mainly fat. The rest of myelin is protein. So the immune attack in multiple sclerosis is directed against proteins in the myelin, but the majority of that myelin is is made up of fat. Fat is a really good electrical insulator. So with the the nerve fibers, the axons in the brain and spinal cord, you have these normal little gaps in the myelin, and so that electrical uh, information is jumping from gap to gap to cap. Uh, where, you know, where the areas of fat or not. Okay, so who can tell me the significance of C, fine Corinthian leather? And again, you guys can raise your hand if you don't want to type it all out. And I'm showing my age here. No, no takers on that one? No. No takers. That was the uh, Chrysler uh, uh, Cordoba. So Ricardo Montalban advertised for Chrysler for the this this uh, big sedan car. And when he was doing the commercial, he totally made that word up. But in his really cool Spanish accent, he said, fine Corinthian leather. And the, the marketers just loved it. He totally made the word up. So th there is no such thing as, as fine Corinthian leather, but it just sounded so good and made people want to buy the car. 
just a moment before you said it, Jim got it. He oh, he did. He's a, good, so, yeah. good job, Jim. All right. All right. I like this question. How many ghosts appear to Scrooge in A Christmas Carol? Jim says five. Five. Or uh, got to clarify. So that's not the answer. I was looking to tell me the. Can you unmute and tell me the five? Uh, Jim, you have to request to speak. So raise your hand. And uh, you can unmute. All right, you got the uh, past, present, future. Um, you've got the one telling the story, and you got Bob Marley. So, so the person telling the story, I don't think is is actually a ghost. So, so I've heard people say five because when Scrooge goes to his door at his house, his door knocker turns into a ghost. But that's actually Marley too. So, so the I think it's four. So I think yeah. it's Marley and the past, present, future, like you were saying. So, yeah, I don't think the person telling the story is actually. Uh, actually, the the ghost, but not, but but you, you we'll we'll have to do some more research on that one. I haven't Russell, heard I haven't heard five before. Russell says four. Karen says four. Um, Melissa says three. But I think it's four. You, the usual answer we get is three because people forget about poor old Marley mm -hmm. coming to talking to Scrooge. Yeah, and if you've not seen the Disney version of this, that's what this picture is from. Really, really good. Yeah. So this these are the four that I counted. The Marley um, past, present, and future, but great. The Disney version is wonderful. All right. PML, another acronym. PML stands for progressive uh, multifocal lymphopenia, primary multifocal lymphedema, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, or pyloric, pyloric metachromatic lipodystrophy. Jim's on it. He says A. He's going with A. But better check those because they all they sound awfully close. So you went with a progressive multifocal lymphopenia. That one's not correct. Sherry asks, is it C? It is C. So progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Um, yeah. So lymphopenia is when you don't have enough uh white blood cells or lymphocytes when they're when they're low. Uh, lymphedema is when you have fluid accumulating in your your legs, which some folks do deal with uh, with MS. And the leukoencephalopathy is just a, a big term for you've got something going on bad in the white matter. And in this case, it's something very specific. It is something driven by this um, P, so PML. So what causes PML? Is it Epstein Barr virus? Is it Jakob Kreutzfeldt? Is it trickle-down economics, or is it John Cunningham virus? I see a D from Melissa. Melissa is correct. So JC virus, the JC in, uh, stands for John Cunningham. That was the first human from whom they actually isolated the, the virus. You know, generally, it's a good rule in medicine. You don't want things named after you uh, because it, you, you may have not done very well with it. Uh, some people get confused with uh, JCV, the jo John Cunningham, and Jakob Kreutzfeldt. Uh, Jakob Kreutzfeldt is a is a bad disease. So Jakob Kreutzfeldt is caused by something called a prion. Prions are small pieces of genetic information. That actually, they're smaller than a virus. People ever actually argue whether it's actually a living entity, but because it cannot replicate itself, what it does is this little piece of genetic information gets into a, a an animal and takes over your genetic information typically in the brain and starts making your sort of genetic hardware reproduce more of those little prions those little things and so it's it it's it's in a class of disease called spongiform encephalopathies it it literally eats holes in the brain unfortunately leading to death usually within 2 years at most because the 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 genetic that little genetic information is so small and it's it's smaller than a virus, your immune system can't recognize it. Uh, so you mount no immune response to it whatsoever. So your body really has no way of fighting this off. All right, back to Christmas. According to It's a Wonderful Life, what happens every time a bell rings? Russell says an angel gets its wings. Russell is darn right. 
good job. Yeah, great movie. So every time, according to Jimmy Stewart, every time a bell rings, uh, or actually his daughter uh, says that an angel gets gets their wings. Good job. All right. Um, what is it called when you when you bend your neck uh, forwards and get an electrical sensation in your arms or legs? Is that the how it hurts syndrome? Is it Lermite sign? Is it Uthoff's phenomenon? Or is it the Bensky sign? Karen's coming back. She says B. B. Karen is right. You have to make the questions harder next time. Um, so this A is obviously totally made up, but it sounds good. Uh, Lermite was a French neurologist in the late 1800s who first described that. Obviously, in the 1800s, there were no MRIs or spinal fluid exams. So everything was really based upon the, you know, the clinical findings. And, and what he described is that you know, when people uh, in France who he was was treating bent their neck forward and got these fundamental sensations, if he followed them over time, and eventually at some point when they died in old age, did a, a, an autopsy, they had uh, multiple sclerosis. Uthoff, uh, so Uthoff's is that the funny phenomenon of getting overheated and having neurological symptoms. Uthoff was a, a, a neuro-ophthalmologist, so he originally described it with optic neuritis, so again, no MRIs, no spinal uh, fluid exams. So what Dr. Odhoff was doing is putting suspected patients in a hot tub of water. And if their vision got dim in one eye or the other or both eyes, he said, this is probably multiple sclerosis. So the original uh, Uthoff's phenomenon was really used to describe visual changes with uh, with heat exposure. We've count, kind of now use it in a bigger way. We kind of use it to refer to any neurological symptom that acts up with, with uh, overheating. And I, it, uh, we were talking about Babinski back with Borborygmy. So Babinski was a, a German uh, neurologist who uh, described so the, the way we torture you in the exam room when we uh, scratch the bottom of your foot. Normally, when you scratch the bottom of your foot, your big toe should should go down. With with things that have bothered the brain or spinal cord, like multiple sclerosis, the toe goes up and the, your other toes kind of fan out and around. So that's a positive Babinski sign. It's not specific to MS. We certainly can see it in MS. You can see it in stroke, spinal cord injury, cerebral palsy, a lot of other conditions. Um, a lot of these things that we describe as abnormal, like a Babinski sign, are actually normal in newborns. You know, we we are not mild, fully myelinated when we're born, and we probably really don't fully myelinate, you know, into you know the our, our to five or six years of age. So if you look at a, a newborn, they actually have a positive Babinski sign, it's, and it's, it's not abnormal. It's just because they haven't made all their myelin yet. So. Treating an MS relapse with steroids will A, improve the ultimate recovery of function, B, prevent future relapses, C, potentially lower blood pressure and blood glucose, or D, potentially speed up recovery from the relapse. The first person to answer was Brittany, and she says D, as in D. 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 See, I'll tell you, man, folks are just too smart. So that's, you know, that and and we we work with medical students a lot and and you guys should really be proud of yourselves i mean you, the our medical third year medical students don't get all of these right um so a lot of our students would say a they think that the steroids improve recovery of function um and they they, they can they definitely can speed up the recovery from a relapse but they don't change where you end up at and a lot of that we know from the optic neuritis treatment trial from years ago. In the optic neuritis treatment trial, if you treated people with optic neuritis with placebo versus high-dose steroids versus just a, a little bit of oral prednisone, the group that, the, uh, that got the high-dose steroids got better faster. But when you looked at all of these, these groups at six months, they all recovered to the same degree. So one of the important messages with this is we don't want people to feel like they've missed out on something if they don't treat a relapse with steroids. You will still recover, recover to the same degree. You just may take a little longer to get there. We still want to document those relapses. We want to know if you've had one um, because that you know, the presence or absence of relapses is going to factor into how effective we think your disease modifying therapy is. 
Um, so C, uh, the, you know, it's act, the act, exact opposite is true. The steroids can actually raise your blood pressure, raise your blood sugar. That could be important in someone with hypertension or, or diabetes. And they, they have not been shown to prevent uh, future relapses. Shifting to Hanukkah. Hanukkah is known as the A, alternative to Christmas, B, festival of remembrance, C, eight nights of giving, or D, festival of lights. Aaron Scott Festival of Lights. Very good. Good job. Um, for any of you not aware, there is this project going on right now um, called Project Menorah. Um, just because of some of the, the troubles we're having in the world right now and, and some of the, the hatred uh, that's being expressed towards uh, towards Jewish people, what Project Menorah is, is doing is asking non-Jewish people to put a menorah in their window for other people to see, just to show that you that we stand against any of the, the violence and, and hatred, anti-Semitism. Um, so yeah, just if, if you're inclined to show support for uh, friends and relatives who might be Jewish or, uh, or co-workers, that's, that's a nice way of doing so. I'm getting one of those soon. And, and Amazon sells everything. I've got a really cool one. It's got, it's got LED lights and yeah. All right. Which statement is true? A, there are no racial differences in the prevalence of MS. B, black people are at a higher risk for getting MS than other groups. C, white people are at higher risk for getting MS than other groups. D, Hispanic people are at higher risk for getting MS than other groups. The first message that I saw was Russell who said B. B. I tell you, I'm just amazed. So again, I did this with my third year medical student this morning and he picked C. C would have been the correct answer four years ago, maybe even three years ago, but as new research is coming out, for the first time ever, we are seeing really the primary group that is, that is at higher risk seems to be Black females. And we don't know quite what to make of that. Is it that we were told in medical school, I was taught in medical school, that MS was much more common in people of Northern European descent, that your, your prototypical patient would be a 30-year-old, blonde, blue-eyed, white female? Did we were we guilty of just believing that that was the risk group, and so we didn't look for it as much in other groups like Black people, or is it really changing? Is the are the demographics really changing? Um, I it may be some of each. Um, I mean, I I like to think that it's it's probably more that the demographics are changing. Um, and the reason part of the reason I think that that may be the case is traditionally relapses. And black individuals have been potentially a little, a little bit more severe. So it may be that you know if you're if you have a, a more intense relapse, you're more likely to go and seek medical attention if you and, and potentially be diagnosed more quickly. In the optic neuritis treatment trial from years ago, if you took age-matched women, so you have two 25-year-old women, the only difference is that you have one black female, one white female, they both have optic neuritis. The recovery in the black female, equal treatment, everything the same, recovery would not be as good in the black female. So, so we'll, we'll see. And if it is true that it maybe is becoming more prevalent in black people, then the question is why? You know, we're not changing genetically as a species that quickly. I mean, this is something that's happened here just over the past you know, a few years. So it would make you think it, it's got to be something environmental. And so that, that will be a question for researchers going forwards. All right. Great Christmas uh, movie. What is this boy's name from one of the best Christmas movies ever? Have we found one that, that people don't know? Uh, I'm... So far, that's what it looks like. Melissa says Timmy. T not a Timmy. Karen that's says one. Ralphie. Who said Ralphie? Karen. Good job, Karen. So that is Ralphie from Christmas Story. He's the kid that wanted the Red Rider BB gun, and everyone, including mom, Santa, teacher, everyone said, you shoot your eye out. 
So, all right, Karen, for bonus, bonus extra credit, what was Ralphie's little brother's name? Russell said Randy. Very good, Randy. That that question tortured us. We were on a medical trip to Nicaragua with no internet service, and we're doing trivia questions, and, and someone asked that, and, and all of us drew a mental blank. We couldn't think of it, and we had no internet access for, for about a week, because we, we had to wait till we got back to civilization to look it up. So, Ralphie and Randy. All right. Um, what is the best way to know that you're not emptying your bladder completely? So you have bladder dysfunction with your MS. How do you know if you're not emptying your bladder? Is it A, leakage with cough or sneeze, B, an MRI of your cervical spine, C, a bladder scan, or D, waiting for, uh, for to have a UTI? We have Cs across the board, but the first D one is from Sherry. We have a whole bunch of right people. So that <laughs> is correct. So what we're measuring with a bladder scan is your post void residual. So normally when we empty our bladder, we should have almost nothing left in there. And to measure that post void residual, we used to have to put a catheter in and actually measure physically measure the amount of urine that was still there. Fortunately, now we don't have to do that. We can just use ultrasound right under your belly button called a bladder scan and get a quick and easy read on how much is in there. There is an algorithm that we use in the MS world that was developed at one of the uh, Seattle VA hospitals where they're seeing MS. So the, the number that we use is 100 cc's of urine. If you're dealing with bladder dysfunction and you have under 100 cc's of urine, we usually think of you as being in the small overactive bladder camp. If you have a large uh, amount of urine, you know, over 100 cc's, usually we're talking 200, 300, 400, 500 cc's of urine. You're in the other end of the spectrum. You are, it, you're in the large underactive bladder. So on one end, small overactive bladder, you've got a bladder that fills up a little bit and wants to go right now. You know, maybe it waits till you get to the bathroom and maybe it doesn't. Feels like there's a gallon in there. You go and you're like, really, that's it? And then 30 minutes later, it's doing the same thing. At the other end of the spectrum, think of it like a glass filling with water and it's just overflowing the top. It never completely empties. It can spasm. You can still have some urgency with the, the big bladder, uh, but it's never emptying. That poorly emptying bladder is a problem from really two different aspects. It's a setup for urinary tract infections because that urine sitting in there is a great place for bacteria to grow. It's also not healthy for your kidneys that back pressure in the, the bladder here in the little cartoon, these are your ureters going upstream to your kidneys. So if this is not emptying, that back pressure is reflected upstream via the ureters to your uh, kidneys and you can get hydronephrosis or damage to your kidneys with years of that sort of, sort of damage. Good job. All right. In a Charlie Brown Christmas, which character did not eat December snowflakes? They always waited for January because they thought the December ones were too, too early. They weren't ready yet. Jim says Lucy. That is darn right. Lucy, good job. Yeah, Lucy waited for the for the uh, the, the better tasting January snowflakes. All right. This is from our physical therapist. They really wanted me to make sure we put at least one good rehab question in here. So when transferring from a manual wheelchair to a bed, the very first step is to A, check your blind spots, B, remove your shoes, C, lock your brakes, or D, perform a few stretches. Jim, again, he says lock your brakes. Darn right. So lock those brakes. You don't want that to push up on that chair and have it go shooting out from from behind you, you you will not stick the landing if you do that. Good job. All right, what does HSCT stand for? Is it A, highly specific cryotherapy, B, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, C, hairy seals can't translocate, or D, high-speed cell transfusions? Karen was first, she said B. Absolutely right. So hematopoietic stem cell transplantations. There's a lot of interest in the MS world and stem cells in general. And, and when we're having that discussion, we always need to clarify, are we, are we talking about mesenchymal stem cells 
which are cells that, that have the potential to per perhaps repair damage in the brain or spinal cord, or are we talking about bone marrow stem cells in the HSCT procedure? So the idea with HSCT is that if you have a dysregulated immune system that is causing damage in the brain and spinal cord, let's just give you a new immune system. So we're going to, to, uh, to take out immature cells from the, the bone marrow that can actually be uh, drawn from, from blood samples. These are cells that have the potential to regenerate any cell in the immune system. We're going to save those. And now we're going to clean your hard drive. We're going to shut down your existing immune system with a process called immune ablation. So this is high dose chemotherapy, various regimens that are looked at in, in research to wipe out your existing immune system. And now we're going to give you your own immature stem cells by blood transfusion back and let you regenerate a fresh immune system that doesn't have the knowledge to attack your brain and spinal cord. So it does work. We've learned a lot over the years about who is probably the most appropriate person. Research suggests that I, ideally a candidate for HSCT would be under the age of 50 and have very active relapsing MS. Active inflammation on MRI, they've probably failed one or two uh, current disease modifying therapies. Um, unfortunately, the, you know, there's a lot of interest in HSCT and some a lot of folks are understandably interested and may not be ideal candidates. So for instance, you know, a 65 year old person with primary progressive MS may not be the ideal candidate for, for this procedure. It is still not FDA approved in the US. It is being actively researched. I fully believe that there will be a day when this is approved for MS in the US. If where research is headed in MS is towards being as aggressive as we can, as early as we can in the MS process. Well, it doesn't get much more aggressive than this. And the appeal to the, the procedure is it's a one-time deal. You know, do this once, and in theory, the person is treated for life. So stay tuned. All right. Which of the following is not likely associated with a higher risk of MS? Epstein-Barr virus mercury amalgam fillings, low vitamin D levels, having a parent with MS, childhood obesity, and girls. Which of those is not felt to be a risk factor or for a high risk for MS? Aaron and at least five others say B. <laughs> B. Two, guys are too good and too fast. So you know, there's been a lot of interest in the past in mercury amalgam fillings. When I first got into the MS world, Back in the, the early uh, 90s, that there, we still had people going to dentists and having mercury amalgam fillings uh, removed. You don't see them used much anymore, but it's not because of a risk of MS. It's really because the, the, there are better products out there now. Um, you know, if you have them in, in your mouth and, and you want to get them taken out cosmetically or your dentist says they're breaking down, they need to be replaced, by all means, get them replaced. But, but don't do it just because of, uh, of MS. Uh, Epstein-Barr virus clearly has been linked to a risk of, of MS. Uh, there's been other research looking at other viruses, but this seems to be the, the one that things keep coming back to. Researchers at Stanford last year made a big leap in discovering which of the uh, amino acid sequences on the surface of Epstein-Barr virus are fooling the immune system, which antibody is being produced in reaction to those amino acid sequences and what it is reacting to in the central nervous system. That's a big leap forwards. And hopefully you know, we're going to see, you know, uh, some, some therapies, you know, coming on the heels of that. Um, it has been estimated that if we had a vaccine against Epstein-Barr virus, if we could shut it down in childhood, we would probably significantly reduce the, the prevalence of multiple sclerosis just by that one, one thing. Um, about 85% of people do have low vitamin D levels. You know, we, we joke in our clinic sometimes that we're the vitamin D clinic. It is important to get your levels checked. Um, not every MS healthcare provider out there believes that correcting vitamin D has an effect on the MS. I, I do. I believe that, that the research does show that there's a lower risk of relapse and new lesions on MRI. And there are other health benefits to, to having you know, normal vitamin D levels. Uh, if your mom or dad has MS, you have about a 2.5 to 3% chance of MS in your lifetime. That is higher than, than the general population. And in, in uh, uh, adolescents, 
uh, childhood and uh, adolescent obesity, especially in girls, has been associated with a higher risk of MS. All right. Which drug is used to treat, uh, is, I'm sorry, is not used to treat MS bladder symptoms? Would that be tizanidine, oxybutynin, or ditropan, DDAVP, tolteridine, or detrol, or murabegron, or merbetric? Which of those is not a bladder medicine? Sherry says A. Tizanidine, absolutely correct. So tizanidine is an antispasmodic agent. Uh, so uh, both oxybutynin and the tolteridine, detrol, or what we call anticholinergic drugs. Um, uh, the merbetric is one of a newer class of drugs, different mechanism of action. In a perfect world, we'd probably go here first in treating your, your small overactive bladder. Uh, your insurance company is probably not going to let us go here first. They're going to want you to have tried at least one of the older classes of drugs. And in fairness, a lot of people do okay with some of the older medicines. Now, one of the side effect risks with our anticholinergic drugs, the Japan detrol type medicines, is dry mouth and constipation. You don't tend to see uh, as, as much of that with the, the newer classes of drugs. DDABP is kind of a, a, a different way of managing some bladder symptoms. It actually doesn't work on the bladder. It works at the kidney level and tells your kidneys not to produce as much urine. We might use this at bedtime if someone's having to get up a lot at night to go to the restroom uh, just to try to you know, make their life better and improve their sleep. All right. Okay. Urban legend has it that, that this company invented Santa Claus. Which company is rumored to have invented Santa Claus. Russell says Coke. Too good. So obviously near and dear to, to our heart here in Atlanta, uh, the home of Coca-Cola. Um, actually not true. Santa Claus has been as involved as kind of a, you know, a, we've mentioned St. Nicholas as the real person and then kind of over, over the years, but they certainly did some beautiful artwork uh, at Coca-Cola in depicting kind of, kind of the way probably most of us think Santa Claus uh, looks. All right. How about how many people in the United States uh, have multiple sclerosis? Is it a billion, a million, 400,000, or none MS is fake news created by the Russians? B, uh, Russell says B. A million, absolutely correct. So we use this number, 400,000, for forever. Uh, you know, I, uh, it was being used probably, you know, when I was in residency in the, in the, the, uh, the uh, 80s and 90s. And we really wasn't up until uh, probably within the past 10 years that the, a new survey was done. And this is the, the number. This, is, this may be an underestimate as well. We may be you know, really more 1.5 or 2 million, but, but probably a while till we get a, a new study. All right. What real life department store is featured in this movie, A Miracle on 34th Street? Karen says Macy's. That is absolutely correct. Good job. Um, that's actually probably one of the Christmas movies I, I don't watch as much as some of the, I like it. I just uh, don't watch it as much as some of the, the other ones. All right. Thank you very much. That was our last question. Again, I'm always blown away uh, by, by uh, how intelligent everyone is. I'll throw out one final bonus round. And, and I like doing this one because in all the times I've asked this, uh, either on programs like this or in real life, I've only had one individual who knew the answer. So name the three wise men, the three magi. Anybody want to take a stab? Yes. It's a bit unfair because it's actually not in the Bible. It's in some of the other texts that didn't get included uh, in the, the Bible. They didn't make the cut. You can also raise your hand if you don't want to type it out. Yeah, they're pretty long names. Or at least one of them is. Yeah. Um, I see Christian says Balthazar, Gaston, that, that, and I can't pronounce the other one. So Balthazar, can you spell them out? He's got one. He might probably yeah. have the other two. Um, M-E-L-K-I-O-R. Melchior, that's two. Uh, and the third one, he said Gaspar. Man, we, we have, I've got number two human being that knew the answer. Good job. 
Yeah. So those are the three, three wise men. Um, I mean, if, if you are you know, a Christian, if it's of interest to you, there's some great documentaries on YouTube that look at, at kind of the, 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 the historical evidence behind the wise men and who they probably were and kind of what the, you know, what was driving them. So have wonderful holidays, everybody. So do, um, do we want to name the name right now for who the, who uh, got the, the drawing for the $100 gift card? Casey is on it. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love about her. She says that Melissa is the winner of their random draw. Melissa, congratulations. We will get that in the mail to you uh, within the next couple of weeks here, hopefully, hopefully sooner. And, um, with that, we will sign off and everyone have wonderful holidays. And until we get together again next year, take care. Take care, everybody. Uh, we don't have any more conferences scheduled for the year. This is the last one, but you can keep up with um, the scheduling for 2024 by visiting msfocus.org. There is an events tab at the top of the homepage. Um, and we do thank you guys so much for playing again. This is always such a blast, Dr. Thrower. Thank you so much. I hope that we can actually start doing it in person again. I would love that. I would love that experience too. Hopefully next year, fingers crossed. But well, if we do it uh, in person, we'll make sure to have some live elves and other uh, Santa's helpers. <laughs> I'll dress up as whatever you want. So <laughs> awesome. Have a great one, everybody. Take care. Random thought though. Um, happy. Frank Sinatra Day, he would have been 108. Random oh stuff. Right now, but <laughs> Random thoughts. Awesome. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Bye.